Welcome to this week's episode of Talk of the Town. My name is Philip Swiskid, and I am back with my good friend, Dr. Kenneth Harper from Vein Specialist of the South, coming to you live from the Daybreak Day Resource Center in beautiful downtown Macon, Georgia. Daybreak helps over 100 homeless people each and every day, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But first, for those of you joining us on WMGT, Thanks so much for welcoming us into your home this week. Here's what you can expect from us every Saturday morning at 8.30. A conversation between myself, Dr. Harper, and someone in the community that is a, about advancing middle Georgia. This week is no exception. We're joined by Jeff Batcher. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's very nice y'all to have me. So Jeff, you're a longtime Maconite. You were, you were here and it sounds like that you did some work in some other places and you ended up coming back to the middle Georgia area to do a lot of uh, community service work. Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, Macon is my hometown. I was born here um, at the old Macon Hospital, which now is, let's see, Navicent Atrium now. <laughs> so um, born there, grew up over in East Macon next to uh, Lake Arrowhead, if people know where that's at. So. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, my upbringing was something, um, my childhood was nothing I'd rather, ever really care to live through again. It wasn't a great childhood. So I think that really set the stage for me of all the things I've done now is that, you know, be, be frank, alcoholic father, uh, mother, you know, couldn't find work. So um, had people that came to the house to pick up the furniture. You know, I remember when mom went to get the, get the government cheese. You know, we all remember that. So that kind of set the stage for me of, what life could be like and how things could be very difficult in someone's life. So I was fortunate to um, have some good mentors in sports. And so um, got a football scholarship at the University of Utah, lettered in football and baseball in Utah, and then came back to Macon, was a sportscaster here for six years on Channel 24 with the infamous Ron Wildman. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I um, was lucky enough to uh, get a job at Bell South Mobility. I actually walked in the door when they were starting to sell cell phones. So wow. the old car phones, remember those oh, big yeah. bag phones and all those? <laughs> so worked my way up through Bell South uh, until I was eventually reporting to the CEO and responsible for all global public relations. And then did the same thing for Delta Airlines, reporting to the, C the CEO there responsible for, you know, internal, external, financial comms, all those things. Um, and then did a stint out in Colorado for a couple years for a friend of mine who needed some help at level three, the long haul fiber company. But um, Macon was always drawing me home. You know, we, I've always had my house that my bride and I have had for years there, but I always wanted to come back. And so then about 10 years ago, I said, look, I'm done, you know, from doing the corporate stuff. Mm. And because what's the old saying from the Forrest Gump, you know, movie, there's only so much money a man needs is and the rest is just for showing off, right. you know? <laughs> so, and I got nobody to show off to. And right. so I really wanted to get involved in the community and, um, and this is what I've done, and this is what I'm passionate about. Still do a good bit of consulting work. I'm very fortunate to do a lot of work with Amazon. But this is really what I spend 60% of my time on is mm -hmm. the nonprofit um, endeavors. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Jeff, I've always uh, respected you for your commitment to serving others and really low-key service behind the scenes, a lot of it. And we see you on TV sometimes handing out the food for those people who need food or other things we'll talk about today. But... I really admire you for that. And one of our goals and what we're our discussion today is that would inspire other people to be get, to be involved in things they're passionate about. And some of the people watching today are gonna to be passionate about the things that you're involved with, and that would be step alongside what you're doing to help make a difference. So thank you so much for that. And that's our goal today. And you have great. a great story and we look forward to uh, you sharing it with us. Great. Glad to do it. So we're sitting here today in the Daybreak Day Resource Center, um, who, again, as we talked about earlier, and as you were telling me before we began, that they actually serve up to 100 homeless people each and every day, right. literally right here where we're standing. Yes. And it's not a, a, an actual homeless center. It sounds like it's just a resource center for people to be able to come in. Can you tell us a little bit about that and about sure. your passion for helping the homeless? Sure. So this is a day resource center. And again, 100 people a day come through here and the purpose of this facility is to have individuals to get them off the street for the day and to get a hot shower. This is one of the only facilities here in town where you can get a hot shower, um, get your clothes washed. You know, people always say, well, why don't they get a job? Well, don't you think it'd be a good idea if they could take a shower and maybe get their clothes washed if they want to go and apply for a job? It helps. Yeah. It helps, yeah. So this is what this facility does. There's also uh, medical care that happen happens here. We've just started mental health care as well. Uh, we have a dentist that comes in. They can get counseling here. 
So this is a complete day resource center to provide you know, our homeless brothers and sisters who don't have any other avenue to go to, who are sleeping out on the river this way, sleeping under the bridge, to give them some dignity and to help them get out of homelessness. That's yeah. our ultimate goal, is to get them out of homelessness. Um, and it's a tough job, I can just tell you. 10 years ago when I started getting involved, I thought, oh, come on, how hard could it be to you know, get somebody out of homelessness? Yeah. Let me tell you, this is a tough thing to do. It takes so many different organizations to be involved because 80% of, again, our homeless brothers and sisters have mental health issues or they have substance abuse issues or many times both. And, you know, I'm always about being honest about this. So we've got to find a way for the, to help those 80%. And it's not a panacea. There's mm -hmm. no easy way. Each individual takes a lot of work to get them placed in housing. So mm -hmm. this facility provides a great um, resource, as does Lowe's and Fishes, as does the Rescue Mission, as does Mulberry, all of us working together to help the homeless. And it's a full-time job. But Daybreak provides that. It's been here about, it'll be 10 years this coming uh, next year. It uh, provides that great resource for those in need on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you have any quick stories of someone that came in here homeless and through a resource center like this, they were able to get back up on their feet and they're gainfully employed now and life has totally turned around? Absolutely. There are several individuals that this has happened to um, that have come through that are now um, working. There's a gentleman who came through this who, was, um, uh, who lost his job. Um, the very quick story on this, he, um, his name, well, first of all, I met this gentleman here, right? And we were getting ready for our sleep out, which I know we'll talk about in a minute. And I walked up and I saw him and I said, well, hey, thanks for helping us get set up. He was helping us that day. And he said, my name is Carlton. I just want to tell you that, you know, Daybreak's really helped me a lot and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be on my feet soon. Thank you for everything. An hour later, I saw him and I said, Carlton, thanks for everything you're doing. He was keeping the fires going because it gets cold for here. And he started crying. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, no one's called me by my name in months. Because when you're homeless, you're a bum, you're nobody. Thank you wow. for calling me my name. Wow. So that's what this facility does. And that's what treating people with dignity. You know, and if there's anything anybody can understand about homelessness, most people don't want to be friggin' homeless, okay? Yeah. It happens for a myriad of reasons. And, and it's not that, and most of the time it's because someone doesn't have the resources that you and I have. Someone may have made a huge mistake. Maybe they got a DUI, but then they get put in jail. They can't pay it. They have no lawyer and they're in jail. They lose their job. Next thing you know, they're homeless. So it's, it's not as easy as people think to get out of homelessness, but it's pretty easy to get in. And so our goal is to try to stop people that are going to homelessness. And then if they do find themselves, let's give them some dignity and help them get out of homelessness. This place is driven by donations. I mean, y'all might get some foundation. It might be some foundation money and we appreciate that, but yeah. what's the biggest fundraiser of the year that you have? Right, and it's the sleep out that I just mentioned a minute ago. And this will be the ninth right. year that we've had uh, the sleep out. And it's such a unique, um, we actually got the idea from Australia. The Australians did this and it was a CEO sleep out. And so there's not a, not a lot of CEOs <laughs> that make it. So we opened it up to anybody. Yeah. So um, last year we had about 100, 125 people that come out and sleep in solidarity for one night mm -hmm. with the homeless. And I would encourage you, if y'all ever want to do it or anybody else out there that wants right. to do this, it's amazing. You're in your tent for that one night and you hear the noise, you hear the trains, you hear some gunshots in the distance, and you're thinking, how does somebody that is homeless do this every single night? And you're doing it just for one night. Mm -hmm. And it really gives you that solidarity. And we ask people to raise $1,000. And so people, you know, give us $1,000 for the privilege of sleeping outside in the cold <laughs> for one night. But last year we raised $230,000, $230,000 wow. for a one event. And that helps Daybreak um, about 45 to 50% of our expenses are paid by that one event. Okay. It's huge. Wow. It's hey, huge. It's cold in February. And it's yeah, cold in February. It maybe cold. Yeah, maybe yeah, cold. Probably is. Last year it wasn't. Three years ago there was ice on the outside <laughs> of, of my tent. And I'm like, what in the world? Yeah. But you know, but you think about how does somebody do this every single yeah. night? Right. How right. does that happen? Uh -huh. How do you do that? Uh -huh. You know, and what can we do to help them? So right. it's, 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 it, the money is fantastic, but it's more of that having a little compassion next time right. you see somebody that's homeless if you'll sleep out for one night. So if you want to do uh, sleep out, which is coming up pretty yeah. soon, how do, you, how do you do that? Sure, you can go to makingsleepout.com. Makingsleepout.com, okay. go to that and you can register and sleep out or you can find someone 
that's sleeping out and donate to their page. Okay. So if you're not quite ready to take that step yeah. to sleep, you can help someone right. else raise their money. Well, I'll tell you something else very quickly. Right. Last year, because of COVID, we also did um, virtual sleeping. So you could okay. sleep at home if you wanted to. Now, if you slept outside <laughs> all night long or not, we don't know. We're not checking on you. But we did do that last year and it was really huge. And so we put a sign up in your yard that said, you know, sleeping outside virtually for the, um, for daybreak, uh -huh. um, the make and sleep out dot com, blah, blah, blah. So right. we had 40 or 50 people that did that last year. So, cool. you know, uh, that's an option as well. All so right. you can help us there. If you don't want to come down here, you can sleep remotely. When I, when I read your resume, you're part of uh, DePaul USA and part of the uh, Fanwin. Family of Vincentians. Right. It's called FanVim. Yeah. So DePaul USA is a, a US-based focus on homelessness, but the other one's worldwide. Tell us, how'd you get involved with those and what did you learn from those that you brought back to make and to help out, us out here? Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer here at Daybreak, right? right? And so Daybreak is part of DePaul USA. And so they asked me to be on the board, I guess, because I was probably annoying them on ideas and things I have. I had that, <laughs> I had that way of you know, saying, look, here's a way we can fix things and make more money and right. uh, help, our, help our brothers and sisters that are homeless more. So I'm on the board of DePaul USA, we're in seven cities. Um, and so we have another day center in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, facilities in New Orleans, we're in Philadelphia, we're in Chicago, um, we're in St. Louis. And the two new projects we've just started are homeless college students, which people don't realize it's a big issue. And so we've got one at St. John's University in New York we just started, and then one at DePaul University in Chicago. Hmm. So, and we're about to, in January of next year, we'll be opening up a day resource center like this, that much bigger in Los Angeles. Wow. So it's going to be a massive, because homelessness is a big problem there. And what helps us out a lot is the Daughters of Charity. Um, and like Sister Teresa that runs this facility, she doesn't take a salary. Hmm. So hmm. there's no money going to this facility that goes to executives right. pay. This hmm. money, all the money stays here in Macon, and no one's getting a salary here. She doesn't take one. And the Daughters of Charity for the West Coast um, are going to help us fund that and, and start that facility there. And what's so amazing about DePaul USA is that I'm not Catholic. Right. And you know, they let a heathen like me be involved, <laughs> you know, because I'm passionate about homelessness yeah. and getting stuff yeah. done. Uh -huh. So it's a great organization um, that's doing good work. And I'll tell you, you asked about um, what I've learned. And then part of the global uh, organization, the Family of Vincentians, I'm what I think they call a commissioner on that. It's trying to organize all the Vincentians. There's, um, 230 different Vincentian organizations in 150 different countries, trying to get them all organized mm. um, on giving us stats on homelessness so we can go to the Bill Gates Foundation, you know, and ask for a couple million dollars. Right. So it's been hard to get all those things organized, but I've been able to tour different facilities. And one of the most interesting ones um, is in Ireland where they've got what they call a wet center. It's called the Sundial facility where they don't care if you drink there, but they were having a problem with so many homeless people who were alcoholics dying on the street, freezing mm -hmm. to death there. So they opened up this wet center. So in essence, you walk in and if you've got your bottle of vodka, your beers, you give it to them, they put your name on it. You know, here's Jeff's beer, blah, blah, blah. They put it in the refrigerator. Yep. Anytime you want a beer, you get it. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got good food to eat and a clean, safe place to sleep. Mm -hmm. The amount of people who have stopped drinking or reduced their drinking considerably is higher there than in any program that we've ever seen. Wow. Because mm -hmm. they've got a somebody that cares about them. Counseling is involved in this as well. But it's interesting. I don't know if we could ever do that here in the buckle of the Bible belt so anybody would support that. But it's just a way to make my brain work differently. There's different ways to solve problems. It's not always the same way. And that's a way to get homeless individuals off the street and let them not die in the snow. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so. but I think it shows that 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 organization just deeply cares for the homeless. You Absolutely. know, they're not, they're not trying to flip a switch and, and, and fix a problem They're They actually care about that person. Absolutely. And I have been um, so honored to be involved and again, learn so much, um, you know, been to Rome, been to Paris, had the opportunity to be in the room uh, with the Pope um, when uh, there was the 500 year anniversary of St. Vincent de Paul and to be wow. in the same room, you know, with the Pope, you're like, wow, that's, that's, kind, of a, that's, that's yeah. kind of a big deal, you yeah. know? Yeah. 
So, you know, poor kid from Macon, Georgia is in the same room with the public. Like, yeah, you know. I think that is a big deal. Yeah. So, you know, Macon, especially downtown Macon, has seen just a, a, a boom in economic activity in the past few years. We've been so blessed. However, one of the things that's come along with that is the cost of housing downtown has yeah. gone up exponentially. Right before the show started, we were talking, and you said that the average uh, one-bedroom apartment is $1,600 a month right. now. And you and some other people have gotten together, and you all have a plan to implement some affordable housing that's going to be right out the window here. Yep. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, let me tell you, this is this is super exciting. I know I get excited about a lot of things, but, <laughs> but, this, but this is really a big deal. Um, there's been no affordable housing in downtown Macon in years, probably since the Dempsey. So the, I'm a commissioner on the Macon Housing Authority and also on DePaul USA. So what's helpful about being on all these different boards is not to be on them, but to see how you can help and kind of play that three-dimensional chess and see where we also talked about earlier why everybody's doing this, but no one can see the bigger picture. So I, I kind of, not that it makes me look like I'm really smart here, but I can look at the bigger picture on what's happening. So went to the, went to the housing authority, um, went to DePaul, and we're gonna have a very unique co collaboration between the housing authority and DePaul USA. We're gonna build an 82 bed facility, affordable housing, that a one bedroom is gonna be $600 as opposed to six, $1,600. Wow. Um, and this is the first one that we know about anywhere in the United States. Mike Austin at the Housing Authority um, is fantastic. Hmm. And he has investigated and knows all the housing authorities across the country. And to our knowledge, there's been no collaboration like this anywhere. Hmm. It's a very unique one where again, a nonprofit and a housing authority work together. $20 million facility. And as part of this, we're gonna have a 10 bed respite which Daybreak is going to own and pay for. It's $2.25 million. We've already raised $2 million. We've already got $2 million raised for this facility. Wow. We're gonna break ground in January. So this mm. is not a pipe dream. We're thinking about it, or as we say in the South, fixing to. Um, this, <laughs> right. thing is, this thing is gonna happen. So okay? in 30 days. In 30 going days, we're, gonna be, we're going live. Because wow. we've already gone through and got all the tax, uh, tax credits to the Department of Community Affairs. This thing is, is gonna happen. Right. And this respite is really so important because and I don't want to disparage any of the hospitals because they've got rules of how many days someone can stay there. And you know this, Doc, right. about someone comes in, you can only because of Medicare or Medicaid, whatever, they you know, have to go. We don't see people in hospital gowns right. out in front of here mm. who have just got discharged from the hospital. And then, you know, we don't have any way to really treat them. We've got a medical clinic here, but we don't have their medicines or those types of things. So they go back, back living on the river. Mm. They get infected. They're mm. back in the hospital costing them money. So Atrium is working with us and Piedmont is working with us and they're gonna fund, help fund the day-to-day -day operations. We're gonna build the facility. So when someone gets discharged that has no place to go, that is homeless, they can come here in this respite, have a registered nurse, make sure their wounds are cleaned and make sure they take their medicines mm -hmm. and they're not back in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So this will be the only one that we're aware of anywhere in the area. So 12 bed respite, 82 bed affordable housing, um, 16 of those beds will be for Section 8 housing for Daybreak as well. So mm -hmm. a unique opportunity to really help. And by the way, the business community has been asking for this. Mm -hmm. You know, they really wanted us right. to do this because waiters, waitresses, um, police officers, LPNs at the hospital, they right. can't afford to live downtown. Mm -hmm. Now they can walk right. to work, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So this is, um, is gonna be a unique opportunity, I think, and really gonna be benefiting making. Right. So last December, there were a couple of homeless men that, that died outside yeah. here in Macon. And that spurred some activity that I think made a difference, the warming yeah. center. I don't, were you, you may not have been directly involved with that, but we saw some things and we hear a lot of positive things. Yep. It was big and it was tragic. It was Christmas Day. Yeah. Two um, gentlemen froze to death. I right. sent a text to Lester Miller and I said, we can't have this happen again. We're better than this. We cannot let this happen in our mm -hmm. town. That's before Lester was mayor yet, right? Um, He'd been elected, I, but maybe not installed. Or just, that is correct. It was yeah. December. So he, yeah. he took over in January. Yeah. So, um, because it just, I mean, how, how do you let this happen? How do you let two people die? And right. so he called me immediately back and we talked and he said, I'm going to do something about this. Hmm. He said, um, I've got the Brookdale Warming Center. You know, he was on the school board and we talked a lot, asked questions, and then he got a lot of other people involved. So I don't want to overstate yeah. my importance in this in any way, right. shape or form. But um, we talked and I gave him some, I was like, here, here's what I think is going to work. Here's what I think is not going to work. Here's what we've tried at daybreak that's work. Here's what we've tried at daybreak that doesn't work. Here's what I've seen that works in St. Louis that didn't work, blah, blah, right. blah. So, but he took the ball and ran with this and implemented this. 
And it's something that's needed to help, again, get people on that path to get them housed. So it's a fantastic facility. I think just like the initiative here, uh, the mayor said that people are calling around the country and said, how did you do that in a matter of a few weeks? Yeah. And it was a passion for something and willing to get out there and a community support. Exactly. Broad community support, which made a big difference. That's exactly right. He has just done, I think, a wonderful right. job. And that was the first initiative because he really cares about this. And right. when you care about something, you you won't find any barriers. You find right. a way to get it done. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you do. You just find a way and you get right. it done. So, you know, hunger in middle Georgia and really everywhere is just really difficult to see. And so it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's kind of hard to know how many people are struggling with this. Do you have any numbers for the middle Georgia area for how many people are struggling with hunger? So I'm on the board of the Middle Georgia Community Food Bank and was the chairman of the board in 2020. And the estimates that we have on the 24 counties that we serve is there are 100,000 people in the middle Georgia area that are food insecure on a daily basis. How many people? 100,000. Out of... How many, what's the total population? So the total population, I um, don't know if I know that off the top of my head of the, of the 24 counties, but um, it's- That's a significant so, number, 100,000. It's, it's it's yeah, it's a significant number. Right. And it's one of those things that we've got to battle with every day. Hmm. And the, again, the food bank, 24 counties, 170 um, food um, organizations that we work with uh, in the 24 counties. I mean, keep in mind, I mean, we're from Telfair County to Lamar County. Wow. I mean, you know, so we're so you've I mean, got a big, so it's big a big race. geographical area right. with, you know, in essence, 18 employees, you know, that have to cover this whole area. Um, during uh, 2019, I again took over board chair in 2020 and 2019, we served 8.6 million meals in the 24 counties. Hmm. In 2020, it was 10.1 million meals. So 10 million meals we helped distribute in the 24 county area. And you remember the long lines and the distribution right. that we had right. and everything. Um, it's, uh, it's a real problem. And, and, and what was so humbling during the pandemic and these massive food distributions was to see people that you knew, you know, sometimes that were small business owners, you know, people that owned restaurants and all of that. So it was a very mm -hmm. difficult time. And right now we're trending, we're about 8.8 .8 million meals as of right now. So we'll probably mm -hmm. end up probably at about 9 million meals through the mm -hmm. end of this year. So it's trending down about a million meals, but still 2020 was quite a year. We couldn't have done it without the National Guard. They came in and helped us um, mm -hmm. at the food bank to help distribute food and the like. But um, food insecurity is still a major issue. And, and again, those are things I try to focus on. You know, there's people in the academia that can figure all the big things out, but right. let's get somebody housed, let's get them fed. And that's kind of the basics right. of life, yeah. you yeah. know? Uh, let's not worry about, you know, red or right. blue or any other stuff. Let's get right. somebody in the house and let's get somebody some food. So where, how do you, Get 10 million meals. I mean, how does the Middle Georgia Food Bank, how does that happen? Right. Yeah. So, and how does the community help with that happen? Yeah. Those 170 partners that we've got, so it's from the faith based community, the churches in the rural areas, it's Meals on Wheels, it's the Rescue Mission. Daybreak is an agency, as we call them, right. of uh, the Middle Georgia Community Food Bank. So, uh, Kathy McCollum has been a year and a half now, the new president of the food bank. And what she's done a fantastic job on is getting more of these agencies because you want to get the food closer to the people. Mm. It doesn't make sense on an ongoing basis to take a truck from Altmogee East Boulevard mm -hmm. and take it down to Dublin, Georgia and tell everybody to come to one location. You right, know, a lot right. of people don't have transportation. So you've got to set up these food pantries. Uh, and that's what we've done to, with different places so you can say, Monday at two o'clock to four o'clock, come to this church. Then on Wednesdays, you can go here in East Dublin and find food. And you can go to the, um, there's two places. Uh, 211 can tell you where they'd like, your, give them your zip code, they'll give you the closest food pantry. Or you can go to the United Way website or the food, Middle Georgia Community Food Bank website. And there's an interactive map that you can just push so, that you're closest location. So if you need food, what do you do if you, if you find yourself needing food? So 211, call 211 or go right. to the website of the Middle Georgia Community Food Bank and there's an, and there's an interactive map okay. that'll show you, the, show you the closest location for you to get food. Okay. And so just like 911, you literally dial 211 and yes. it connects you? Yes, you dial 211 on your phone and it can help with all manner of different services. So if you're food insecure, um, if you need housing, um, if you're um, a medical, if you're if in the military, you need military help. So 211 is a great resource that United Way has done a fantastic job on. So you, you serve on the United Way and the Boys and Girls Club too. Right. And that kind of dovetails with your mission. Tell us how that all kind of uh, 
measure together? Sure. So, you know, George McCandless is just the, has done a fantastic job at the United Way. Right. I mean, what he's done since he's come and taken over um, of getting involved in the community. In the past, United Ways, if you've worked at a large corporation, it was you gave money to United Way, United Way got the money, and they passed it back out to their respective agencies. He's got involved now and done so many things with Volunteer United, the reading program, which has just been so helpful to so many young mm -hmm. kids. Um, Mission United, helping veterans. Right. So, I mean, you know, you, you hear a story from a veteran who says, I was on the verge of committing suicide if it wasn't for this program. George has just done a great job. So I'm honored to be a trustee of the United Way because, again, helps me see all the different organizations, what they're doing, and to make sure that we're all just not necessarily staying in our swim lane. Right. I, I like to say that, you know, we're all in our swim lane. We're doing a good job, but there's people in the pool that are drowning. You know, right. we can't just stay in our, the nonprofits, the churches, the governments. We've all got to start working on these larger problems like right. poverty. Yeah. The poverty rate is 30 percent here in middle Georgia. Yeah. The state of Georgia poverty rate is 19 percent, 30 percent poverty. Right. What the hell are we doing about this? You know, why do we just keep talking about it? I mean, all, we, should, we should be organized. And that's what George is doing. He's got a poverty initiative. We can try to get somebody out of systemic poverty. It's just right. it's one of those things we just cannot let continue. So anyway, sorry, a little passionate about this stuff. Right. But I mean, you know, it's that, one of those things we, we that's just true. It, it, it's it's not it's not insolvable. Right. It's one of those things we can help with. It takes vision and it takes leadership. Yeah. And without vision and leadership, people are lost. Yeah. Right. So we've been fortunate to have a number. You've mentioned uh, half a dozen people that have vision and leadership right now. So we're in a sweet spot right now to make a difference. I think you're right. So and we need to go for it. Yep. I think so, you're right. And, you know, it's interesting to me, and I think this is lost in the conversation, that when literally a third of the population in middle Georgia is below the poverty line, yeah. that, that hurts all of us, too. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's, it's not one of those things where it's just isolated to them. It impacts all of us. And uh, I don't think that that can be underscored enough. No. I mean, it affects everything. When prospective businesses are considering coming here, they look at those things, you know. Mm -hmm. So it affects all of this. It affects the schools. It affects the law enforcement. You know, it affects the health care. All those things are impacted by this. And so we've got to find a way to get out of this systemic poverty. 30% is just, it, it quite frankly, should be an embarrassment mm. to us here in this area. So we're going to change, change tunes a little bit. Okay. I, music is a, a passion part of you. And, you know, I mean, you're the football player and the baseball guy, but... <laughs> Uh, you're multidimensional. Tell us about music and your life and how you think that fits into a vibrant community. And you were involved with a couple organizations like the Otis Redding Foundation and also the Mercer Robert Modeffi Center for Strings. Right. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I have no talent at all in music. That's why I love it so much. <laughs> you know, I mean, zero talent. So I do think it helps with, you know, it help, it's just been proven over and over that it helps a child's brain. And yeah. um, Bobby McDuffie and um, um, Carla Redding and Zelma Redding have all done just remarkable jobs. I remember meeting Bobby when he first talked about opening up the, the McDuffie Center for Strings. And that guy has taught me so much. He is so determined. He was like, I'm going to get this done. Well, before you tell people might not know a lot about Bobby. So oh, I'll tell them a little bit about who Bobby is. So Bob McDuffie's from here in Macon, Georgia, went to First Presbyterian Day School, is one of the top 10 concert um, violinists, or you say, yeah. uh, say violinist anyway. I sounds should, right. Sounds <laughs> right. Um, violist, maybe that's it. Right. Anyway, he's really good with the violin. So <laughs> he's one of the top 10 in the country, plays all over the world. Um, I mean, he goes to Paris, he's got the Rome, he plays in Rome every year. I've been there, I went a couple years ago. There's, I was there and there's billboard buses that say um, Rome uh, McDuffie, you know, um, concert, you know, wow. on the side of buses. Right. Wow. Um, and it's just, I got pictures, I got pictures. So he is just so passionate about what he's doing and bought the uh, old Bill's 1860 house, you know, and converted right. that over. Ironically, that was my first job, washing dishes at Bill's 1860 when I was 14 years old. Right. So every time I walk in that building, I just think about, again, how my life has come full circle here. Yeah. But he's been great. Otis Redding Foundation, the work they do with their camp for kids mm -hmm. and all of that, it's just, it's just fantastic. And, and just one quick story, if I may, that happened right here in this building is I've gotten the students from the McDuffie Center for Strings to come down and play here at, at, at noon for the homeless. And the first time they came, it was about this time in December. And so they were playing music. The students, I could tell, were a little, you know, a little nervous. 
you know, homeless, um, you know, participants were like, eh, what's going on? Who are these kids and everything else? They started playing that music. And you could just see the, 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 those who were on the streets and stressed about their life just get relaxed. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most memorable moments I've ever had in my life to see mm -hmm. that, how that music just affected everybody here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and then they played some Christmas music and they sang along and they, you know, they're like, they couldn't remember the words. And it was like, yeah, I used to sing this as a child. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it was just a remarkable moment of what music can do and it was, it was so memorable to me, I'll never forget it. And the students are gonna come back here in a couple of weeks, um, here in December and come back and play again. So I really appreciate them doing that because right. it just, again, the juxtaposition between those two was remarkable, yeah. remarkable. Yeah. And the fact that, that the McDuffie Center for Strings is here, yeah. I think is a testimony to President Underwood and the vision for Mercer, but mm -hmm. that's available to everybody in the community because they're free concerts yes. that are given. Uh, exposure. There are students from all over the country, really all, all over the, the world, world, that apply to be yes. uh, a part of that. And where it exactly is, is that? Is the McDuffie it's Street? on College Street, um, right there in the middle of College Street. And people know making it's the old. It's called the Bell House now because really? they bought it and contributed. Oh. And it's the old Beale's 1860 restaurant. Right. That's so neat. Yeah, it's in so free neat. concerts there. Anytime you want to go so in the solarium, it's just remarkable. Highly recommended. Yeah. Now you're on the foundation, though, just Reading. Yep. And whether it's McDuffie's or whether it's the Reddings or, you know, all these families who give back in the community, they, they have been going over and above. One, to preserve the legacy of Otis. Yes, but they've done great. Work. the opportunities that they're affording are pretty awesome. And they're getting ready to, uh, to they have a venture going on right now, don't they? Yeah, well, it's, um, I don't know if it's ready for prime time, but yeah, there's gonna be some big news uh, that right. will be coming from the Reading Foundation um, on something that they've been working on, right. that we've all been working on. I guess I've been on the board maybe eight years um, mm. with the Otis Reading Foundation board. And so there's something they're working on that's gonna be big news, um, that's really gonna improve the education and the music education that they've right. already done for years. So. More to come on right. that. It's going to be exciting. The thing you know about the Otis Reading Foundation, if you give funds, it's going right back into the community. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's being put back into the community. And they have the office over there on Cotton Avenue yep. right now. If you go by there, uh, Zelma's there sometime. Yes. So she loves to talk and visit with her. And we filmed an episode and had the best time with her. It right. was fantastic. I, I mean, yeah. isn't she great? I wish I could tell the stories. Maybe when the cameras go, I'll tell you some of the stories <laughs> that she's told me that are right. phenomenal stories. She's great. I That's love her. That's fantastic. So yeah. in addition to all of this, you, were, you, you, you played football in high school. And then you actually went and played college football as a quarterback. Was it at the University of Utah? Correct. Is that correct? Yep. And you still go back to a lot of the games, right? Yep. Uh, okay. lettered, lettered in football and baseball at the University of Utah. So, wow. yep, um, honored to go back. And, you know, you, I was um, given the Alumni of the Year Award uh, last year at the wow. University of Utah, which was very kind to them. Just a massive event right before, actually it was 2020, right before the pandemic hit. It was February. Right when I went to Salt Lake City, and then I thought, my gosh, I've given COVID to everybody, you know, because <laughs> everybody was hugging everybody and everything else. But um, so, yeah, I like to go back and go to the games there, and um, I was at the UCLA game, and so um, if, and this will run after um, they play oh, um, Oregon for the Pac-12 championship, if they win that, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go to Rose Bowl. So if Good they win you. that, Good I'm going to go you. to the Rose Bowl. All right, yeah. so if Utah plays Georgia, I mean, do you think Utah would have a chance? Uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> well, remember, remember we beat Alabama. Remember when, that's yeah. right. when, when that's we right. beat Alabama in yeah. the Sugar Bowl seven, eight, nine years yeah. ago? That's we right. beat you, them. Uh -huh. So you never uh -huh. know. You never it know. Can it, it can happen. happen. But Utah's had a great year. Great year. We sure have. Yep. So. We're ranked uh, right now 17th, uh, 15th in the country. Yeah, we were texting back and forth about that game yeah. a few nights ago. Uh, Saturday nights, uh, a couple weeks ago. What yeah. game was that one? When they beat Oregon so bad. That was uh, like... Yeah. Impressive, we right? We beat them. So we got to play them again, and they'll right. know by the time this runs what happened in that Pac-12 championship game. It was, it was great. Right. You know, all of us have. Uh, I, was, I played uh, sports in high school, played in college some. And I had a coach or so that made so much difference in where I am right now mm -hmm. that I've thanked many times. Do you have someone like that in your life that really was a catalyst for – I know you talked about some of the hard times growing up, but – you want to, somebody you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, the, the person that, I, the reason I'm here today is my little league baseball coach, Vernon Sinclair. And the field that we built over there, I named after Mr. Vernon Sinclair. So he was the guy that 
came and picked me up for little league baseball practice. I had no way to get to practice. Mm. Um, and he knew that and he would make sure that he would trade other players to make sure I was on his team so he could come pick me up every year, every year for practice for three years. Mm. So if it wasn't for him, I would have never been involved in sports because I would have no, no, no way to get there to play, to start to play baseball mm. and other sports. Um, and he also just taught me about being there. Right. He wasn't a great motivational speaker. He, he was a decent baseball coach. He worked at the Macon Telegraph for 40 years as an old typesetter, lived in the same house for 40 years. He was just a regular guy that yeah. came in this old, nasty, beat up, blue <laughs> station wagon <laughs> that I loved seeing. That wow. there was somebody there that cared about me that was gonna come and take me to baseball practice. Right. So he was a remarkable guy that I would not have anything in my life if it wasn't for him. And, I'm, and I always am constantly thinking about him and trying to pay him back and hopefully transcend right. you know, to somebody else that will realize right. there's others that have helped us along the way. What can I do to pay it back? Right. I always think that's, that's the best kind of thank you you can give is being that person for somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And, but it sounds like- have had someone like that in their life. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like Vernon just showed up. You know, and that there wasn't anything necessarily special, but that he was there yeah. when you needed him. Yeah. And it's kind of like you said, the question becomes, who is it we need to show up for? Yeah, him? that's exactly right. right. It was, I mean, this is a longer story, but I mean, I got dropped off. Um, a mother had found a job and she had split shifts back in the day when you worked, you know, and then had to come home for lunch. And so it was after tryouts and I had no way to get home. Mm -hmm. And we're talking all Moggy Little League, and I lived way out, all the way down, you know, Gray Highway, all the way down at the end of Sterling Drive, almost oh, in yeah. Jones County. Wow. Right? And so I'm there and I'm thinking, well, how am I going to get home? We hadn't thought this whole thing out, you know? <laughs> and so this guy, you know, this, he had been there with his son and been tried. And he said, you know, son, you know, you need to ride home. And I'm like, yeah, I've got to get home. So and that's how it all started. And he started the conversation and um, just became that friend in my life that, right. you know, again, if it wasn't for him, I just don't, there's no way I'd be here now. I right. mean, that one person and that one kind gesture just during the summer changed my right. life. That's cool. Great guy. So there's something out on Anthony Road that you're <laughs> really passionate about that, that the whole community may not be aware of. Tell us about, tell us how that idea started and tell us about it and just go with it. What do you want us to know about well, that? Well, so I guess probably about seven or eight years ago, there's a program that Major League Baseball has. It's called Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities. Mm -hmm. It's an inner city uh, program where they're trying to get African-American kids, both boys and girls, to play baseball because it's an expensive sport. And Major League Baseball, just quite frankly, is concerned there's been a large dropout you know, of you know, black players. There's just not, not, there's not enough of them in the sport, which transcends to not enough of them eventually being in the stands right. you know, right. of, of, of you know, playing, playing baseball. So anyway, we started the RBI program over there at um, Tom Fontaine Park, which is right across from Henderson Stadium. Um, program has been successful. Um, we've got a scholarship for a young woman um, um, who got to go to college through the program. Um, Twelve of our kids got to go to the All-Star Game in Cincinnati five years ago, I guess it was. These 12 young men, 11, 12-year-olds, had never been outside the city of Macon, had never been on the plane before in their lives. Got to stay at Xavier University change those kids lives i still yeah. hear from their grandparents saying you know my son never thought he could go to college he was told you're not going to college you're not good enough kid walks around sees other black kids that are there there's college students and he thinks huh maybe i might want to go to college one day that little spark you know right. so anyway the program's been successful um then um, learned that the cal ripkin senior foundation has got a program where they'll help you build fields they've built about 80 of these youth development parks across the country mm. Um, so I contacted them and annoyed them to death, um, as I have a habit of doing, and found out all the nuances of how this all works. Um, got a large contribution. If you raise half the money, they'll give you the other half. So the county gave me $750,000, um, and then Cal Ripken Senior Foundation gave me $200,000, Major League Baseball gave me $250,000, and then I raised the rest from the Peyton Anderson Foundation. Benji Griffith was very gracious to me and donated money. Um, and so raised it enough because we had some additional costs, as always happen right. in construction. Right. <laughs> so it was $1.6 million synthetic turf field over there, right behind Anthony Holmes. Again, 30% poverty rate. Some of the highest concentration of poverty in the United States of America is right there. And it's a fabulous multi-purpose field, baseball, softball. Boys and Girls Club runs it on a day-to-day -day basis and it's had flag football there. Yeah. Um, 
And so we're gonna introduce lacrosse, the Marshall lacrosse coach, I'm working with him. We're gonna introduce Man. lacrosse out there that's never, this kid's never been introduced to lacrosse. So my mantra has always been, just because you're poor, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have access to some of the nicest facilities. Why is that always just in North Macon? Right. So we've got the nicest field anywhere um, right there. And so it's just been fantastic. And I hope the field gets used day and day and day, which it will be. So I, tell me, uh, did Coach Snicker come out there? <laughs> did he remember that? Did he really spend the night at your house? No, uh, it wasn't at my house. Okay. So um, you guys probably know Bill Shanks. Oh, yeah. the, um, yeah the uh, radio uh, sportscaster here in town has got the talk show. So I've known Bill forever. So when we did our groundbreaking, so uh -huh. this was 2019, if I'm not mistaken, 2019, we did the groundbreaking on the property. Um, and it was in December, if I remember correctly. And so I said, Bill, do you think we could get anybody from the Atlanta Braves? So Bill says, well, we'll call Snicker. Call Snicker, Snit, and he's driving up from a fishing trip. And so this was on a Thursday and the, it was on Friday that the event was. So Snicker goes to Bill Shanks' house, sleeps on the floor, <laughs> comes to our event, you know, on Friday, eight o'clock in the morning, is in the back of the audience, doesn't make a big deal of himself or anything else. And I was pulling for Brian Snicker, the Braves to win the World right. Series. I was pulling for Brian Snit, Snicker more than I was the Atlanta Braves. Right. Wait, so Bill Shanks made Brian Snicker sleep on the floor? Exactly. Oh, right. my goodness. Yeah, exactly. Oh there you go. Word. There you go. Right. So, I mean, Snicker is just, I would mow his grass for life if he asked me to, <laughs> because he's just the most nicest, humblest guy in the world. Right. And I needed a paperwork, I needed um, um, a high executive from the Braves to sign a piece of paperwork for me. Right. Um, to also endorse what we were doing to get that money from Major League Baseball. I FedExed that to his house. He signed it immediately. He FedExed it for me to Major League Baseball. He's the most genuine guy in the world. Is that our facility here making the only one outside the Atlanta metropolitan area right now in Georgia? Thank you for asking that. Yes, yes. it's the only one actually in the Southeast. Um, um, they've got some in Florida, but the only one in Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, or Alabama. The only oh. youth development park through Calvert Queen Senior Foundation, only one. Wow. It is a world-class facility. I was right. there at the dedication because yeah. I heard so much about it and I was like, I've got to see this. It is absolutely gorgeous. And it is, it, it's in one of the, the poor yeah. parts of town. And it is so neat looking around at, you know, a lot of those homes that you're like, man, a lot of these kids, they're gonna be able to play right here. Yeah. That's such a great thing. Yeah, I know. It's just, um, if I don't accomplish anything else in my life, I mean, I'll, I'm just so proud of that because right. it was a lot of work with a lot of different people. Talking about the three-dimensional chess with, oh, yeah. right. you know, the Board of Education, Bibb County, um, Housing Authority, Cal Ripken, Major League Baseball, right. you know, all these different organizations and all the different people involved. To get that all organized and get us going on the same path was right. quite the feat. So anyway. And to raise 1.6 million. And to raise 1.6 million dollars. Yeah, and, and the 1.6 you know. million. Yeah. Hey, hey you're, kind of, you're kind of the big deal, okay, with no, sports, I'm but I'm there's somebody else in your home that oh. may be a bigger deal than you, right? Yeah, absolutely. So my bride, uh, Janet Batcher, uh, we've married 32 years now, and uh, we met when I was a sportscaster. And so she was actually inducted into the Macon Sports Hall of Fame 10 years before I was. <laughs> oh my goodness. As uh, we met when she was coaching basketball at Baldwin High School. She won four state championships in a row, um, went to the final four six years in a row. So she was one of the most successful high school basketball coaches in the state of Georgia. And she hates when I say these things or talk about her, but <laughs> she still has one of the highest winning percentages right. ever in women's really? basketball. Right. Um, huh. And so, yeah. So, yeah, it took me 10 years to get into the Making Sports right. Hall of Fame, and she was in 10 years ago. I'm like, yeah, great. And I bet she reminds you of yeah, that. Yeah, she, she hey, does. Hey, you were telling us a story earlier about your friendship with Bill Kerr, Coach Bill Kerr. Bill Kerr, yeah. So you want to tell that story again? Because I think <laughs> people will find it a little bit humorous story, but tell us yeah. about that. Well, those of you who don't know Bill Curry, I mean, Bill Curry was uh, the starting center in Super Bowls one, three, and five. You know, coached at Georgia Tech, Alabama, Kentucky, started the program at Georgia State. Um, was, I mean, he's been he's in every Hall of Fame that there is. Just an unbelievable guy. So I always, you know, I was a backup quarterback in Utah now. So, okay, you know, <laughs> so that's why I've still got, didn't have as many concussions as everybody else. <laughs> so <laughs> only had a dozen or so. Right. So. So I always wanted to take a snap from Bill Curry because I thought, just think of the hands that have been underneath and took the snap <laughs> from him. I mean, so Bart uh, Starr, uh -huh. Johnny Unitas, Joe Namath during uh -huh. the college all-star game all took yeah. snaps from him. Wow. So I've been, I, I have a tendency to bother people about stuff. So I was bothering <laughs> Curry about this for years and he said, all right, I'm gonna take care of this. So he calls Georgia Tech where he played and coached 
gets us on the field at Georgia Tech at Grant Field, uh, gets the photographer, the, the staff photographer for Georgia Tech there, and I get to have my hands right. underneath taking a snap right. from Bill Curry right. and touch the same uh, bottom right. that, um, <laughs> that uh, all these other stories. That stuff. was a cool story. I guess the moral of that story is if Jeff Batcher calls you to do something, <laughs> just go ahead and do, do it because yeah. he's not going to let you go <laughs> until yeah. you you get that he gets what he needs yeah. to make make it a better That's place. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's easier just to go ahead and say, <laughs> just succumb. Say yes on the front of it. Exactly. That's great. Right. Now, as we start moving towards wrapping up, sure. uh, Dr. Harper and Vane Specialists are all about advancing middle and downtown uh making georgia Done a great here. job too and, yes yeah, and it's it's so great to see the progress that's made but you know if if someone has heard your story today and if they've been inspired but they just don't quite know where to go to get started to make a difference where do you think you would point them it, you know i think i would tell them first to think about your passion what do you what do you care about what have you had happen in your life that you want to help improve um, you know, I got involved with um, the McDuffie Center for Strings. I walked up to Bobby McDuffie. I saw him on the street and just introduced myself and said, look, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing for making. How can I come, how can I be involved? Mm. So think about what you want to change and what you have the capacity to change. All of us have the capacity to change, just like we talked about just being kind to a homeless person and saying their name. So you have that capacity but you've got you've to really feel it in your belly. You know, you've mm. got to feel it in your gut of what you want to change because if you just want to show up and be on a board, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what it's about. And it's not even about your money. It's about the passion that you have. And you've got to find out what that is first. Now we've got some questions about some work that you've done um, overseas. But before we get to that sure. really quick, Earlier, you were talking about that, that here you guys need volunteers even more than money. Can yep. you guys talk about or can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. This is one of those COVID hangovers that's happened to everybody. Yeah. But um, volunteers, not only here at Daybreak, but all the facilities, all the nonprofits, from the Boys and Girls Club to Loaves and Fishes to the Rescue Mission to the Food Bank, everybody's really hurting for volunteers because there's COVID protocols, who's had, got the vaccination, elderly, a lot of retired people, I should say, um, you know, don't, um, are concerned about catching, you know, the coronavirus um, still. So if anybody can volunteer, that's the biggest thing that all the nonprofits need, and especially here at Daybreak, we're desperate for volunteers. Wow. Right. Um, I've been going to Greece now um, for about 12 years. And so this has started on the Mercer on Mission, which is just a fabulous program. Right. I know you've done interviews with Dr. Underwood, uh, with uh, Mr. Underwood. Um, and so I started going. Uh, with a friend of mine who's a neighbor um, and working really with Aroma. So first of all, we're working um, at uh, right outside of ancient Corinth and you know, ancient Corinth's kind of important, you know, Paul right. kind of wrote a few letters from there. Yeah. So that, that has some, that's some interest. And so right outside of there is Ismia and there's this large archeological site that um, Ohio State originally had that now Michigan State has taken over. But we come in and also bring the students and learn about all the rich, rich archeological history that's there and it's one of the largest mosaic bass anywhere in the region is there. And you can look all this up, it's fantastic. So hmm. I've learned so much just about archeology span and all these professors put up with me when I asked the same question five times because I can't really quite figure it out. Okay, it was the Romans, then it was the Greeks, <laughs> then it was the Persians. And then, you know, <laughs> when did these other cats come in? And then, you know, so it just helps right. me understand the world. And um, I'm so glad to be involved and then as part of that, the real Mercer on Mission is working with the Roma, not only with the health clinic, but we started a soccer program there um, a number of years ago. And again, these are very, very poor um, individuals. That the Roma is you know, the, the, the class of people that no one likes throughout Europe. And their, their homes are actually on the town dump. This is the land that they were given um, wow. right outside mm -hmm. of Ismia in a little town called Eximilia. Um, and so that's where their homes are. Um, so anyway, we started a soccer program and um, Mercer's helped and I've got other equipment we've sent them. And so they've gone now from, and I don't know the classification, so they've gone from class A to class F or maybe it's F to A, I don't know. Anyway, so they've moved up the classifications in soccer and it's helped the whole community and these kids are now in school. So it's just another way, again, to give back and it just, again, makes my brain work and makes me help as many people as I can. Now in Africa, you helped with some, a basketball program. So in, uh, I've been going to Africa now for about three years, been going, go, going back again this year, working with a friend of mine who's a drummer in, uh, in Nashville. He started, I, I met him, 
he's got a lightning protection program. He and his wife were doing this like out of their suitcase. Hmm. So, you know, he says, well, we put lightning protection up on schools um, and churches, and it's really to dissipate the lightning. And I'm like, in your suitcase? And I'm like, I'll take care of this. You know, yeah. that's, that's just mantra. You know, it's like, hey, you, you got you doing with your suitcase? I'll fix this. <laughs> so we started shipping a bunch of stuff over there, and I went over there with him. And I'm, Tom, I'm on top of one of these schools and I'm helping put this lightning protection stuff up. And I see this, and I see this log with a metal ring around it. And mm -hmm. I go to the, the principal there and I said, well, what is this? He said, well, that's our basketball court. Right. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, okay, I can fix this too. <laughs> I, I think I can fix everything, okay? So that's, that's, that's a problem I have in life. And I think I can fix everything. So long story condensed here is that we got with the local villagers and they... They're farm implements that they use. And again, these are people who have no running water and have no electricity. So they took their farm implements and leveled out this area, brought in rocks, broke them by hand to put the, put the gravel down. I bought the cement and we built a basketball court there and they're waiting to put the final layer on because they wow. want to dedicate it when I come there. Right. And I told them to go ahead and put it in. They've already got the goal up and everything else. Right. But, and, and so next year, we're going to, um, I'm looking at another basketball court and do more school. So this is gonna continue um, right. in, in, in as long as I can to do this. I can see this, it's probably the Jeff Batcher Division One basketball scholarship at Mercer University. And one of those kids from there will be They'll playing be from there. at Mercer yeah. one day. Let me, let me tell you, there's some great right. athletes. And you know, the yeah. NBA <laughs> has got an African program, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. And so there's a lot that we've done with there. Right. The Atlanta Hawks have been very helpful to me and said, Jeff, right. do you need equipment? And right. so um, wow. there's a gentleman I know that's in the community relations there at the Hawks, and he's right. gonna help me send equipment and stuff over there right. when we go back next year. That's, so it's fascinating. That's cool. Fascinating. Now, just to bring things back here to, to back to uh, Middle Georgia, just for a moment before we actually do wrap up here, um, I want to I want to blindside you with like two questions, okay? okay? All right. Complete blindside. He has no idea that these questions All are right. coming. That, that's Pat Benatar me, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Hit me with your best shot. <laughs> so, one, what do you see as the biggest challenge that Middle Georgia is facing? And then, two, what excites you the most about Middle Georgia and the direction that we're going? Yeah. So I would say that the biggest issue, and we briefly talked about this, is the poverty rate. I think that we've got to figure out how to reduce that poverty rate. Uh, because you just cannot have, again, third, percent, third percentage of our population that is below the poverty line. And we just can't sustain that. As we talked about, it just hurts so many different things. So we've got to figure out what we can do with that. But what gives me so much hope and joy is the things that we've been able to accomplish. The people like George McCandless, the people like Lester Miller, uh, the people that run the baseball uh, program, Bernard Snell, Freddie Stewart, Michael Rogers, my friends over there who work every day helping those kids over there. There's so many people that are doing great stuff. If we can harness that ability that everybody's got, get everybody out of their swim lanes and let's look at a holistic approach, there's nothing we can't accomplish. And I believe that in the soul of my being that we can do this. If I can build a $1.6 million athletic field, baseball field, soccer field, lacrosse field, in the third highest concentration of poverty in the United States of America, you can do anything. And I'm convinced we will. That's fantastic. Jeff, thanks for your time. Dr. Harvey, do you think we missed anything? No, but that's why we do this show, to get that message out, to hear the stories like we've heard today, and to give people a vision for what we can be. We're, we know what we are now, and we're a lot better than we were just a few years ago, but to know what we can be. Yep, exactly. This right. is the center of the universe, as everybody knows right. I call it. This is That's the center right. of the universe. Right. Let's do it. We can right. do it. Yeah. Let's do it. We can do it. Well, I definitely hope you guys were as inspired as much from Jeff's story as I was. Uh, this is just has been such a fantastic conversation. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate your time, and thank you for inviting us into your homes this week. Stay tuned, because you never know where me and Dr. Harper might show up next.
I work in inventory management, requiring a lot of walking and standing on concrete. After many years, my legs were bulging and swollen and embarrassing, and I hated to wear shorts or even a bathing suit. Plus, I'm a mom. I'm very active and love shopping and outdoor activities. My legs got worse over the years, and I was having trouble sleeping because my legs ached and they were restless. Hearing great things about vein specialists of the South, I called and made an appointment, plus it was covered on my insurance. An ultrasound showed my legs were even worse than I thought. The staff were very caring and professional, and I loved the way the doctor talked to me during my procedure, explaining everything. This made me feel completely comfortable the entire time. And the best part, there was little downtime and I could feel a difference in my legs immediately. If you're having vein issues and ready to improve the quality of your life, I highly recommend calling Vein Specialists of the South today.